Today on episode 85, I'm continuing my conversation with my friend, Laura Keybart. In last week's episode, we talked about stations, why we should use them, and how to make them work for your situation. If you haven't listened to that episode yet, then be sure to go back and listen to that first because it is packed with so many tips. Now, on this episode, we're talking about incorporating small group instruction into your stations, and you can do that for differentiation, as well as how to train your students for stations so that they run smoothly. Welcome to the Teachers Need Teachers podcast, where we help new and beginning teachers navigate through those crazy first years of teaching so you can maintain your sanity and personal life. Here's your host, Kim LaPree. Welcome to the Teachers Need Teachers podcast, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network. I'm your host, Kim LaPree, and this is the podcast for new and beginning teachers who don't want to just survive those first few years, but actually thrive. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I really, really appreciate it. You know, I get so many wonderful emails and DMs from you guys about how much you love the podcast, and it means everything to me. I wish that I could meet all of you and grab a bite and chat about how things are going in your first few years of teaching. Oh, wait, maybe we can do that. If you attend one of the upcoming new Educator Weekend conferences in San Diego and Santa Clara, California, we can meet. This conference is just for new teachers, so it's pretty much a no-brainer to make it a priority to attend. There are so many sessions that have actionable tips to make your life easier, and you'll be surrounded by new teachers just like yourself. I mean, seriously, I wish that I had something like this when I started. And I'll be holding a session and giving effective feedback so we can meet. Now, I've only had a few instances when I've met a listener in person I gotta tell you guys, it was really exciting for both of us. So head over to teachersneedteachers.com forward slash conference to sign up for either the Southern one that's from December 6th through the 8th or the Northern one that's from February 21st to the 23rd. This is Casey Bell, host of the Shake Up Learning Show and a proud member of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of each individual host. For more great podcasts, visit edupodcastnetwork.com. And get ready, because the learning begins in 3, 2, 1. Now, I was thinking about the teacher station. How do you feel about using that to do direct or small group instruction? Yes. So ultimately, the goal here is that you do want to get to the point where you can actually pull a whole group of students. You can pull all your high students. You can pull all your low students. And I'm, you know, I I hate to even use those labels, but just for the sake of what we're doing here, I'll I'll use them. Um, That that is the goal. I want my students working self sufficiently in stations so that I can pull a group of students who all have a common need and I can, I can do some direct instruction with them, or I can do some guided reading with them or I, you know, right. Um, so I am a fan of that. It's just, you have to work up to it. This is important too. It's, you know, especially when you have struggling students there, there is nothing more powerful than getting those kids right there in front of you. There's just something powerful about that proximity, right? You can give the exact same information to a class of 30, or you can give that same information to a small group of five. And it is so much more powerful. You can read their expressions. You can pause when you need to, they can interrupt you when they need to. And it's totally doable with a group of, you know, five or six. Um, so I am a fan of that. It's just, you have to work up to it. And so these strategies we've been talking about here, these little check-ins and strategically using the teacher station, um, that is what gets you to the point where you can do that. In fact, um, on that note with some of our struggling students, you know, a small group, small group, direct instruction can be really powerful for front loading them too. 
Oh, it can be really yeah. effective to pull some kids over who have been struggling the whole time and teaching them something that you're not even going to teach until maybe tomorrow or next week, but so that you're able to build a little bit of a foundation so that when you do teach it, they can grasp onto that. So, you know, and it's one of those things where I know, you you know, people might be thinking, well, wait, how can I teach something ahead of time when they're still struggling with what we're on? But it's just, it's knowing your kids. It's knowing, you know, what is the goal for my kids right now? It's different for everybody and making a choice. If I'm choosing to do this for them, I'm, I'm going to choose to not be able to do something else. And maybe that's okay. Okay. Now you had mentioned getting your students, you know, ready for it, or I guess having them get used to stations and ready for you to kind of pull back and, and work with students um, in a more intense way, as opposed to just the teacher station. So how do we train our students for this? Right. So some of that I've touched on, but yeah, let's, let's go into that. So training our students for stations, first of all, we do want to go ahead and start with the group work concept. Um, we want to have a specific start and end, which a lot of times group work doesn't really have a start and end. Sometimes it's when class starts and when class ends, <laughs> but yeah. you know, but with stations, let's make sure our kids know how long they're going to be in that station, how long they're going to be in that situation. Maybe it's just 12 minutes to start, what, whatever that looks like in your classroom, but put a timer up, let them know this is what we're doing for this amount of time. So the next part is that really you want your students working on the same assignment. So if you have station A, station B, station C, okay, they're all doing the same assignment because right now the point is not differentiation. Right now the point is classroom management and making sure that you as a teacher are getting your questions answered. How am I going to keep them on task? What do they do if they finish early? What do they do if that timer goes off and they're not done yet? What do they do if um, something is missing from their station that they need? Oh, the instructions say they need to highlight X, Y, Z. Well, oh, where are the highlighters? Do they know where to go get them? Are they allowed to go get them? What so, are those procedures? So yeah. are they all working on the exact same part of the assignment? Like everyone's going to do the introduction together? But yes. Okay. Yeah. Keep it. It's about keeping it simple for you as the teacher, okay. because this isn't how you're going to do it all year long. This is just you as a teacher feeling confident in what you're asking your students to do. So okay. yes, they can all do the same thing. Now they have their own papers, right? Like there's none of this, you know, <laughs> Billy's going to write and the rest of us are going to stand, you know, sit here and watch him. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and sometimes we have students who easily become frustrated because they're right and everybody else in the station is wrong. Well, if you're doing your own work, <laughs> then you go ahead and you be right all by your bad self. That is fine. <laughs> <laughs> so we can actually help them work through, um, you know, some of those conversations that may cause some friction. And, you know, if you're giving your kids really good thought provoking questions based on something they've read or seen, they, there can be some, there can be some intense discussions between them. Um, but you know, if they're, if they're responsible for doing their own work, they don't have to write the same thing. So that's just another way to empower your students. But okay. yeah, so, um, but yeah, back to your question. Um, yes, when you're starting out step one, you're just trying to figure out all those things that you need to know as a teacher, who can work together, who should never be together. What do they do if something is missing from the instructions in the station? Do they, is there a place in, in my classroom where they know they can go and get another copy? Is it okay for one of the students to get up and go ask another? Do they know what to do? So that's really the main thing. You as a teacher in step one, you are not sitting down either. You're, you're not sitting down. I'm not saying you can never sit down. I'm saying you're not like over at your teacher table, calling kids up yet. You're not at your desk. You are moving around the room and you're observing. And it's very easy at this point for students to just turn and ask you something and for you to answer, but that you really have to hold off on doing that. If a student raises their hand and asks you something, Hey, can I go get a highlighter? Instead of saying, Oh yes, sure. You would rephrase that question back to them. Are, are, are we allowed to get up and go get highlighters in this class? 
And then the kid, oh, oh, yes, I can do that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I forgot. So you're trying to teach your kids that you are not there to answer literally every question. You're really more there to remind them of what the procedures are when they need something. Right. Because the goal is that you are able to go eventually and sit down and work with a group of kids for 20 minutes with no interruptions. That's the goal. And so, you know, here we are in step one where your students are all working on the same assignment and you're just doing your thing as a teacher, trying to figure out all these logistics. And so when students see that you're up and moving around, it's very easy for them to want to ask you questions. And it's so easy for you to just want to quickly answer, but you've got to make sure that you're responding to their questions in a way that really they're answering them for themselves because you're going to be stepping back and taking yourself away down the road. Right. So that's, that's the first time is we're all doing the same assignment. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Because you also want to check and make sure is the quality of work there. You know, are Mm -hmm. they working to the same level that they would be if they were not in stations? They better be. And so, (laughs) and so that's part of what you're looking for as well. So, and you can't, you can't check on that really. If you're, you know, if it's step one, day one of this, and you're already pulling kids over to your table for a 20 minute mini lesson. So, yeah. And so, I mean, really that leads us into step two. Step two is where you're really, you know, once you know who can sit together, who cannot, once you know how many groups you want to have in your classroom, once you get all the logistics worked out of where they get supplies, if they need them or What happens if they finish early? Once you get all that done, really, really, we are focusing on the quality of the work. So, um, you know, is the work ethic the same? Is the quality of work the students are doing, is that the same? Um, You know, do they turn to you every time they have a question or are they able to figure it out themselves and move forward? So, you know, this is where you really want to see what happens when they get stuck and how they're able to figure out what to do. And so that can be something as simple as, okay, we're all stuck on, we're all stuck on number one. So we're just going to sit here and do nothing. Um, no, you can move on to the next part, <laughs> <laughs> figure out what you're stuck on, write it on a sticky note. And, you know, you can show me the sticky note in a little bit. Um, one thing that I love to do is when students, cause students love to do this, right? Well, I'm stuck on number three. So I'm just going to sit here and do nothing. Cause I can't do anything else. Right. Well, whatever it is you're stuck on, I want you to rewrite the question, paraphrase it in your own words, um, you know, whatever it is, because nine times out of 10, when they go to paraphrase the prompt or paraphrase the question, Mm -hmm. it's like, oh, now I get what it's asking. Right. Because they took five seconds to actually think about what it's asking. So little trick there. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, you know, if they still can't figure it out when they bring you the sticky note with the question that they paraphrased or, you know, whatever, a lot of times you as a teacher, you can see where the mix up was. And sometimes it's, Oh yeah, I could have asked that in a better way. Or sometimes it's, Oh, they're struggling with academic vocabulary. Oh, so it does give you some insight and it gives them something to do when they're stuck. They've got something to do now. At the very least they can paraphrase that question. So then we've worked to, I've had them work on the same thing. I have really pushed these skills where they're, you know, relying on themselves and each other rather than relying on me so that they know how to be more independent during station. So what do I have them do next? Okay. So, yeah. So next, this is where you as the teacher would begin letting them see you sit down at the teacher table just for just for a few minutes. They need to see that you will be sitting down and they are still held accountable. And so the first time you sit down, it's a very short amount of time, three, four, five minutes. And you think, well, wait, what can you do at a station for three, four or five minutes? Um, you can do a lot. So um, you can even set your phone, set the timer on your phone, set it for four minutes and you're, you're calling names. You're calling four or five students from random places in the room, random stations. You're just pulling them up. They know that they are to bring their work with them. Um, it does not need to be complete. You know, if you just started stations three minutes ago and now you're sitting down, they're not going to have their work complete, but (laughs) that's not the point. The point is that they see that you are checking on them and they don't know who's going to be called next. You're not calling a whole group. They really have to be on their game. So, um, that's, what's happening next. So you're calling four or five students 
and you're just checking in. Hey, how are you? How are you doing with those directions? Does the prompt make sense? Hey, read the prompt to me. Okay. Um, if you could paraphrase that prompt, what do you think it's really asking you to do? Hey, so what do you think you're going to do to, um, to start answering that prompt? It's just, just quick conversations. And then you send them back and you can get up and physically move around the room. So you have that proximity going, go back, sit down, do that, do it again, pull up another four or five students. And so from there, let's see how long you can go before you feel like you need to get up. So maybe the next day or maybe the next week, maybe you can get through several rounds of these little check-ins with various kids in the room before you feel like you need to get up. Um, that gives you the teacher that gives you the confidence that your students are doing okay, right? They're doing okay. You're doing okay. And I'd like to encourage you not to don't wait till you really need to get up. Um, it's okay to do one or two rounds of these little, you know, five minute check-ins and then get up and circulate and then go back and sit down. That's fine. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but as you're moving through the weeks, as you're moving through the year, using these strategies that, that pretty much brings us to step four. Maybe now you can pull a group of students over to you. Maybe you can sit for 10 or 15 minutes with those students. Mm. And so you can see where we're headed. You could sit yeah. for 10 or 15 minutes with your students, get up, circulate around the room. Um, if you see sticky notes out on desks, it means some of the kids have questions. So go back to your teacher table, pull up a kid from each group who looks like they have a question, let them ask you. Um, that way they know that, you know, they know and they trust that you're going to be there to check on them when they're stuck. And eventually you can see where you, you can work up to 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes with a group of students virtually uninterrupted where you can actually do, you know, do a mini lesson or do, a, you know, some direct instruction with your students to extend them if they're advanced or, you know, to, um, to help close gaps if they're struggling. And of course, don't forget to check on your, your, you know, your average on grade level kids too. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't want to unintentionally build gaps in them because we're so focused on the other kids. I know it's like, it's always a juggle, but that's the other thing I like about the strategic use of the teacher station is that it allows you to check in on all kids at all times. So, um, it's versatile, right? It's really versatile. Yeah. So, you know, at, at this point, we're at the final step and that's where you can strategically pull certain students to work on a certain skill for an even longer period of time. And of course, depending on the time of year, depending on if you just came off of a long weekend, you can always go back and redo steps two or three, where you're doing those little three to five minute check-ins where you're up moving around more frequently. So, you know, if you feel like, well, we just got back from, you know, spring break or, um, you know, Mercury is in retrograde. We've got a full moon. Like you can always go back to steps two and three and your kids are used to it by now. So, um, it, yeah, it's just, it's such a versatile, flexible and empowering way to get stations going in your classroom and to keep them going as well. Now, when you get to the point, to this point, I'm assuming then you can start giving them different things to work on yes. in their station. So can you give me an example of how you would split up something um, for like maybe just four different stations? Sure. Yeah. So um, one thing you can do is let's say, let's say you read a short story as a class. Maybe this is what you did on Monday. Well, now your students all have that same foundation. They've got the same story, but they can interact with the story in so many different ways. So this is where differentiation comes in. So if you know you have students struggling with basic academic vocabulary, then maybe their job is to take the questions that go with the story. And maybe their job is simply to paraphrase each question. Maybe that's the task for the day for that particular station. I just want to see if my kids even understand what the questions are asking. Like how many times have, you know, have kids said to you, I don't get what this is saying. I don't get what this is asking. And right. you explain it in normal language, like <laughs> the normal way that we, that we speak without mm -hmm. using the word convey or imply. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, I get it. I get it. Well, I don't ever want a kid to feel 
you know, like, like they're going to miss a question or feel frustrated because they don't even know what it's asking. So maybe you've got some students who are really struggling with academic vocabulary and maybe the, maybe their task is to just paraphrase those questions. I just want to know if they understand what they're being asked. Maybe that's it. Maybe you have some other students who tend to rush through their work. They're on level. Maybe they're a little bit advanced. They rush through their work, want to get it done, check the box. And so maybe for them, instead of giving them, let's say there are five questions with the story, instead of giving them all five questions, maybe you give them a very specific question. Maybe it's a two-part question. Um, whereas the kids in the first group I was talking about, maybe all they're doing is paraphrasing it. Well, in this group, you don't want them flying through all the questions. So maybe you just give them one. And then based on how they handle that one, maybe you give them a next step when you check in with them. Okay. So you could literally have the exact same assignment, but you're having students in stations interact with it in different ways. Okay. So if they're responding to a piece of text, like you said, then at each station, they're going to look at that text a different way. Yes. Okay. And here's the thing. All students do not have to go through all stations. Oh. Because it's, this is part of the differentiation process. You may have students who don't need to spend time paraphrasing the question. Maybe, maybe they're struggling with how to find the best text evidence. Maybe they get what the question's asking, but they just don't really know how to find the best text evidence. And you know the kids I'm talking about, yeah, the ones yeah. who, they'll pull anything from the passage, And but I use text evidence. Yeah, that's really not the best text evidence. <laughs> <laughs> and so you can have students struggling with different aspects of an assignment. And so you may have students where you think, okay, you know what, this is the end of station time, but... I want everyone to stay in the same station and continue working. That is okay. Mm -hmm. That is okay. That's fine. Stations, you know, a lot of times we think of stations, meaning every kid has to rotate through every station. Well, not necessarily. It's based on what they need. And so you as a teacher, when you're pulling students up and doing these check-ins with them, you get to determine that. And that's okay. That's okay. You may have students who are actually, let's say now they're doing fine with paraphrasing those questions. They've got it. Okay, great. I want you to pick one. You pick one, your choice. And I want you to answer that. So, oh, that's so, great. so yeah, so you're able to kind of scaffold up based on where they are. Um, but yeah, that goes back to the idea that they don't all need to go through all stations all yeah. the time. And that's so much pressure off of you as a teacher because it allows you to differentiate and meet them right where they are. And it sounds like this is definitely not a good time for teachers to just give busy work. No, you should no. be giving something that, that they can, you know, in terms of working on a skill like standards yes. or mastery based where they can kind of hone in just on that skill instead of seeing like an entire page full of questions. And I can see this actually being really good for my special ed kids who get really overwhelmed when they see too many questions on one page. And so this in a way also accommodates for them because as they move through the stations, they're only getting a couple of questions and they can just sort of switch gears and refocus. Exactly. And that's the power of stations is that you have a very specific amount of time for a very specific purpose. That's it. And it's really good for kids too, who, um, you know, the type A personalities, perfectionists, they can get equally overwhelmed by seeing a whole list of tasks to do, seeing it all at once. That can be so overwhelming. So again, to chunk it and to give them a specific amount of time for one specific thing, then you as a teacher, you know where you can move them next. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I've actually seen a good lesson for revision stations. And yes. so when students move through, they, they take their essay with them and then they revise a different part of the essay when they go to each station. So I thought that was really cool. Exactly. Yes. And that's, I have, I have lessons, activities built into some of the membership um, curriculum pieces where, you know, cause think about it, you, you, you have students trade essays and they're supposed to be editing, but what does that even mean? <laughs> but this is such the, yeah, it looks good. looks good. Everybody's paper looks good. And no, it does not. Um, but yeah, moving through stations like this is perfect. So maybe one station is just, maybe it's just eight minutes and all they're doing is checking for 
I don't know, what's something you just taught recently? I don't know. Let's say subject verb agreement. All I want you to do is check the subject verb agreement in every sentence. That's all you're doing. Um, or, you know, then time is up, move to the next station. Okay. In this station, um, you are checking for capitalization. It could be something as basic as that. I mean, but whatever it is that you've been teaching, whatever it is that have, have been some red flags in your classroom, as far as, you know, what you're noticing in students writing, you could take those items and break each one down into a station where they're checking it. Maybe you have a Chromebook set up with a little mini lesson on it so that they can kind of scroll through a mini lesson you've taught before to look for examples. Um, you know, maybe you taught a sentence variety last week and maybe you had a little PowerPoint or something on that and you could set that up at a station and they're checking for sentence variety in something they just wrote. And oh, the mini lesson is right there. And the purpose of that station is we need to see some variety in your sentences. That's awesome. So, yeah, yeah. Because you can flip the learning too at those stations. Like if they have a device and they have their own earbuds, you know, one station, mm -hmm. like you said, is watching a video and then the next station they're applying it to an assignment. Yes. And, you know, something else I like to do too, I love to use QR codes. And so mm -hmm. I can take, um, you know, a YouTube video that I found somewhere that, that does a good job teaching something. I can make a QR code out of it, um, print it off. And if students have their own devices, you know, and I know every teacher in every school is a little bit different on this, but um, hey, if students have their own devices or if you have class iPads or something, they could scan it, watch the video, and that really helps with accountability because if they've only got, let's say, eight minutes at the station, they can watch the video and then they've got to immediately um, find or implement something in their own paper, done. They don't have a lot of time to play on their phone <laughs> or be off task. So um, yeah, there are so many things that, uh, that you can do with stations, especially when you understand that the purpose is a specific amount of time for a very specific task. And I really liked it when I did stations, students were able to get up and move after a certain amount of time and it kept them fresh. So they didn't have as much mental fatigue from just sitting and doing one type of assignment for a long time. It's almost like they, they had a restart when they would go to a new station. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, the purpose is not to make anyone feel rushed you've got the countdown timer up. Oh my goodness. You only have so much time. It it's really just to make sure everyone's on the same page with where we are, what we're doing and how long we have. And that is, that is so important, especially when we start talking about um, kids with, you know, executive function issues or mm -hmm. kids who need those kinds of modifications. And even for kids who don't, even for, for anybody, but just to know how long I have, what I'm supposed to do is a breath of fresh air because you feel like you know what's happening next. Right. I think that what you just taught us today, you should charge for this. Seriously. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on here and, and teaching everybody all of this because I'm sure a lot of my listeners like me, especially if they teach secondary, you know, we're not used to doing stations as much. I think elementary teachers do stations quite a bit, but I, I haven't dabbled into them as much. So now I feel a lot more confident about my ability to do them. So if my listeners want to learn more about you and and find you, where can they go? They can find me over at languageartsteachers.com. So pretty easy to remember, languageartsteachers.com. And uh, they can email me directly, contact at languageartsteachers.com. I wish I had just used my name instead, but <laughs> <laughs> at the time I thought, well, they're contacting me. So, but that is my email. I do, I do read and reply to every single email myself. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's a great way to get in touch with me. Um, I also have a freebie for your listeners. Oh, yeah. So this has to do with classroom management and accountability, this freebie. So when students go to stations, they have a student instruction card. Every station has one card. And by card, I mean, it could be just, you know, a plain piece of copy paper, but I really try to, <laughs> I try to make them on cardstock. So they're a little bit heavier, mm -hmm. but, um, what it is, is there's a front and a back to it and it tells students what they're doing. It gives them, you know, maybe an example of what they're doing. It gives them a next step in case they finish early. 
and it tells them what to do with that work. Okay. So those are some of the main questions that that we get from students in stations. What do I do when I'm done? Where do I put this? Where do I turn this in? And if all those questions are addressed on the student instruction card, then that's fewer interruptions for you as a teacher. And so that's the freebie I have. I actually, it's, it's a two part system. So the student instruction card, your listeners are going to get it. They get one that's blank so they can fill it in any way they want. And the other one is more of a template where it's the same student instruction card, but I give them examples of what they could put in each of those categories. Oh, okay. So yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, and I used to, I used to type the student instruction cards. Like I would type all my information in and then it got to where, you know what? I'm just going to handwrite it in here. It's okay for students to see my handwriting. Like (laughs) not terrible. And I can do it so much quicker. Right. I can sit in a ridiculous staff meeting and I can fill this out. (laughs) Like, And you can laminate them and just reuse them. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, not that I'm suggesting people, you know, work off task in a staff meeting, only the ridiculous (laughs) ridiculous ones, not the important ones. Um, but anyway, it's yeah. And so when students go to stations, they immediately know, Oh, we need the instruction card. And so much of what's on the instruction card can just be copied over and over and over. Like you can fill it out once and then you just make copies. So you're not having to fill out all these papers for all these stations. Um, because really the only thing that changes is what the students are actually doing in the station, right? Everything else stays the same. And that goes back to classroom procedures. Any, whether your students are in stations or not, what do they do when they're done? You know, Mm -hmm. um, what, what is okay for them to work on? And depending on the station assignment, you may want them to save it Maybe there's a part two coming. Maybe you want them to staple it to something else they did in class. Maybe you want them to put it a certain in a certain tray or certain drawer. Um, if you're one to one, if you're using Chromebook, Google, Google Classroom, or Canvas or some other system, maybe there's a certain way you want them to submit it to you. So that's a place where you put the, that, those pieces of information, and then it's it's one and done. You don't have to do it again. You don't have to answer that same question thirty times throughout the day. Oh, good point. So where can my listeners find that freebie? So we're going to put that um, at languageartsteachers.com slash easy stations. Nice. That's easy to remember. (laughs) (laughs) Easy stations, easy to remember. Yeah. So um, that resource will be there for them. So they'll get the blank copy that they can fill out any way they want. And they will also get the template one with, with the various recommendations, various ideas. Awesome. I really appreciate you providing that for my listeners. That's something that can help anyone, whether they're teaching English language arts or or math or science, everyone can use this. So thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm so happy to share it. I love this topic. And (laughs) it's, it's something that is so helpful if you just understand that it takes time to work up to the way stations are presented to us typically like that, that traditional way that that we're shown stations where the students are working so perfectly and everything is smooth it's just like nobody talks about what it takes to get there so i hope this is helpful and um you know is is a way for teachers to start experimenting with how to begin with stations absolutely i'm i'm ready to figure that out for next week. So thank you so much again, Laura, for being on the podcast. I really appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. Oh, absolutely, Kim. Thank you so much for having me. I was happy to do it. So that was so awesome. And I'm glad you guys got to learn about stations from Laura. I'm totally fired up to try them and, you know, refine the ones that I've done before. And I hope that you are too. So here are my key takeaways. First, Stations allow teachers to pull small groups and differentiate instruction. This is huge. I mean, it's key for any teacher because we all know that our students are at completely different levels. Laura brought up how powerful it is to work with struggling students because those students get one-on-one help with you and the kind of help that it's really hard to provide in a class. You can have conversations where they're asking you all the little questions that they feel stupid to ask in front of the class. And now you can get them to the point where they feel confident and you can better monitor their progress. 
Also, training your students for stations should be on this continuum where it starts with just basic group work at first. So they're all doing the same thing. And then it gradually moves to students being more independent and taking ownership of their learning. So as Laura had mentioned, the first assignment is going to be the same for everyone so that you can train them and get classroom management in check for stations. And then you get to the point where it's second nature to them. You also don't add the teacher station right off the bat because you need to get them to the point where you can sit down and know that they'll stay on task. So little by little, you add these levels of complexity. You add these levels of independence when you feel like you can trust them. Finally, the sky's the limit in terms of how you structure the work. You can obviously use it for differentiation, like I had mentioned. You can also use it for front loading. And you can also have students use QR codes that take them to something like Khan Academy or Brain Pop, and they can watch the video and do work based on what they watched. I think that's really awesome. And also when they get to the video station, that's something that they look forward to, right? They all want that kind of a mental break. Stations really offer you a lot of flexibility and it keeps students engaged. And with a time limit for each station, there's a sense of urgency so students stay more focused during the task. Now, if you want to get the stations freebie that Laura created and mentioned on the episode, head on over to languageartsteachers.com slash easy stations. So again, languageartsteachers.com slash easy stations. And of course, I'm going to have a link for that in the show notes. And these will help you get started with incorporating station rotations into your teaching practice. I really hope that you learned a lot today, or maybe what Laura talked about just reaffirmed that what you're already doing is awesome. Now, if you love this podcast, please, 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 please share it with your teacher besties and colleagues. Wherever you're listening, there's a share button and you can just email or text a link to this episode or maybe another one that you found valuable. It would really help them out because you're sharing the learning and it would definitely help the podcast grow. Thanks for listening today, you guys. Have a fabulous week. Thanks for listening to the Teachers Need Teachers podcast. Love this episode? Head over to Apple Podcast or Google Play to subscribe, rate, and leave a review.